What's up guys, I'm coming at you from Jiangxi, China, and in today's episode, I'm gonna be talking about what is the Communist Party of China. Okay, so today's episode is inspired by a number of things that have come together. Uh, first and foremost, it is inspired by a uh, lecture that I listened to. It was 18 hours long, and it was called From Yao to Mao, 5,000 Years of Chinese History. It took me about six weeks to get through this, and I highly recommend it. It was really good, very balanced, fair, factual, um, leaving a lot of opinions out of it. And the particular part that was really interesting for me was the rise of the Chinese Communist Party. And that is especially because there's so much mystique or worry or wonder about what is the Chinese Communist Party. You know, they are obviously being um, villainized a lot. And the primary way that they're being villainized is with the narrative of what's going on in China in terms of uh, how they're treating ethnic minorities. I have seen a little bit of a shift recently, though, where more and more people are questioning that narrative, both from the fact of saying, hold on a second, we've seen these kinds of stories recycled before, and it turned out to be fake, or by the lack of evidence or the, um, uh, the, the issues that are coming up with some of the evidence that's being uncovered. It's not completely widespread, but I'm seeing more and more of that. However, people who realize that they still fall into um, either one or one of a couple camps, one is talking about, well, I don't like what they're doing around the world. I think that um, they are dangerous for the world, and I think that they need to be taken care of. They might not use words that strong, but this is also a common thing that I hear. And I actually want to play a, a clip for you, which uh, was pretty funny, of um, a lady who was asking a question at an event where she wasn't really asking a question, if you think about it, she was trying to project her understanding of China. And it had to do with what China was doing in Africa. And I'll play that clip for you now. I've been very concerned lately about China. They are now all over Africa, you know, buying things and investing over there and getting those countries dependent on them and supporting, you know, non-democratic people. And I'm just Like whom? Well, we come. We are in a country that supports Saudi Arabia. Yes, that's yeah? true. Right. So, so suddenly we have a problem with, uh, you know, superpowers supporting non-democratic people. <laughs> but please continue. Well, I mean, they're, you know, they're they're in Africa. They're they're lending money to countries to build ports and different infrastructure. To build what? Port. And harbors, what's wrong with that? And. Well, because... Countries that need ports get ports. But they're making people dependent on... I mean, I know, it's the same thing that we've done, which is no, it's horrible not. around the world. They are, they are far more humanistic than the United States ever was. <laughs> really? Okay. Absolutely. Great. So... Let me give, give, give you an okay. example. Of course they are, trying, they are peddling for, in, for, for influence. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, but they are non-interventionist. Absolutely non-interventionist in a way that Europeans, the West, has never managed to fathom. All right, so that is probably a very typical understanding of China, saying that they're going around and they're doing this kind of uh, 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 debt trap diplomacy. And um, she's not thinking about what is it actually accomplishing for these countries, or she's not looking at the fact that uh, their alternative before for these countries was to get loans from the World Bank at a much higher interest rate, which also comes with political requirements. It comes with certain rules and regulations, whereas the, uh, the, a lot of the Chinese investment, they don't have anywhere near as many stipulations. And uh, aside from that point, if you really think about what other options has anybody else given these countries or given continents like Africa? And um, I want to play a, a clip for you from someone else who kind of explains what pretty much was going on before this point. Play that for you now. But that expropriation of the third world has been going on for 400 years brings us to another revelation, namely that the third world is not poor. You don't go to poor countries to make money. There are very few poor countries in this world. Most countries are rich. The Philippines are rich. Brazil is rich, Mexico is rich, Chile is rich. Only the people are poor. 
But there's billions to be made there, to be carved out and to be taken. There's been billions for 400 years. The capitalist European and North American powers have carved out and taken the timber, the flax, the hemp, the cocoa, the rum, the tin, the copper, the iron, the rubber, the bauxite, the slaves, and the cheap labor. They have taken out of these countries. These countries are not underdeveloped. They're overexploited. All right, so these things should make you begin to think about, okay, well, what exactly is going on? And, and, and these countries that are virtue signaling China, what other options did they give them beforehand? Now, for people who don't think about that, the last camp that I feel or I find that people um, move into is saying, well, they did terrible things. The Chinese Communist Party is a terrible government. They repressed their people. Um, they were responsible for killing this many of their own people. And so that's the piece that I wanted to focus on a little bit and pull out some really inf interesting information from this um, Yao to Mao, uh, 5,000 years of Chinese history from uh, Kenneth Hammond, uh, when he speaks specifically about the rise of the Chinese Communist Party so that you can understand where were they coming from, what was going on, and what were the circumstances at the time. So let me see what clip I want to play with uh, here first. Um, all right, so I'm going to jump ahead. Not, I'm not going to focus on the founding of the party, which was uh, July 23rd, 1921. I'm going to jump directly to the point where they started to have somewhat of an influence um, because it was that around that time when the first United Front was formed and the Chinese uh, uh, Communist Party started collaborating with the government in power at that time, the Nationalist Party, and brought a lot of needed organization to what was a highly disorganized um, government at that point in time. And I'll play that clip for you now. One of the problems, one of the frustrations that Sun Yat-sen had faced in his life was that um, he was a good orator, he was a good uh, speaker, a good fundraiser, a good propagandist, but he wasn't much of an organizer and he didn't seem to have figured out a way to make the Nationalist Party into a truly effective political force. The advice of, uh, of the communists and the organizational changes that they helped to put in place within the Nationalist Party gave it greater cohesion, greater internal discipline, and turned it into a more uh, functional political organization. Uh, this did not mean that the Nationalist Party, or Sun Yat-sen, embraced the uh, Marxist-Leninist ideology of uh, the Bolsheviks or, or of the, uh, the advisors from the International, but it did mean that uh, Sun Yat-sen in particular was more uh, open to some kind of cooperation, some sort of uh, collaboration between uh, the new Communist Party. Okay, now later on when Chiang Kai-shek was in charge of the Chinese Nationalist Party, they, he became a little bit more aggressive in terms of wanting to break those ties and get rid of the Chinese Communist Party. They probably felt they got everything they could from this group and they wanted to secure and protect their own power. And the, where the Chinese Communist Party really gained their popularity was by supporting the lowest parts of society. We're talking about farmers and laborers who they set up um, unions for and things like that. Now, on the other hand, the Chinese Nationalist Party, they were relying on uh, warlords or winning support for, uh, from people by uh, bribing them. And it was a little less organic than what the um, Communist Party of China was doing. And I will let you hear a little bit more about that here. Chiang Kai-shek was able to negotiate uh, political arrangements uh, 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 under which uh, local warlords would, uh, would pledge their loyalty to him and would therefore uh, sort of be brought under the nationalist umbrella. In other instances, he simply bribed people. He would uh, 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 you know, buy the loyalty of, uh, of individuals who couldn't be appealed to on any other basis and whom he didn't feel like uh, fighting or didn't wish to risk fighting. By one means or another, uh, the, the Northern Expedition succeeds uh, by the spring of 1927 in basically uh, uh, getting all of southern China, south of the Yangtze River, uh, 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 into nationalist hands. All right, I'm going to play one more clip for you here where it really um, emphasizes and drives home the point that the Chinese uh, Nationalist Party was really uh, relying on some pretty negative parts of society in order to... Um, defeat the Chinese Communist Party. So one of the stories that I'm going to share with you is uh, when they were on their way to Shanghai, a Communist Party uh, stronghold, 
they actually didn't even need to enter the city. They just waited on the outskirts, and what they did was they relied on the uh, colonial powers that were occupying Shanghai to crush the Chinese Communist Party and their laborers and the unions and everything like that that they were working for. I'll play that clip for you now. And accordingly, when the nationalist forces reach the outskirts of Shanghai, he stops. He does not take the nationalist army into the city, um, but instead uh, allows communist uh, uh, organizers within the city and, and within the trade unions in the city. Shanghai was uh, by this time the most industrialized city in China. Uh, many factories there, many thousands and thousands of workers, uh, most of whom were organized into trade unions uh, with at least links to, if not being dominated by, the Communist Party. When the Nationalist Army is approaching Shanghai, uh, the communists launch an uprising. The idea is being to seize the city from within so that the Nationalist Army won't have to fight its way in. Uh, but Chiang Kai-shek stops outside of Shanghai and doesn't intervene, doesn't come in. And the insurrection in Shanghai is then suppressed by a combination of the troops of the foreign powers. Shanghai is sort of an international city, so the British, the French, the Americans, uh, the Germans at this time, uh, uh, the Japanese, rather, um, all have forces there. And those forces, those uh, police and military units, are mobilized to attack the workers, to attack the communists. And in conjunction with those uh, uh, government forces of the foreign powers, um, the, the secret societies, the sort of organized crime circles within Shanghai, also come out and start to attack uh, the workers and the communist organizers. And this combination of the foreign uh, powers and the sort of Shanghai underworld uh, destroy the communist movement in Shanghai. Uh, uh, many, many hundreds of communist organizers and leaders are arrested and executed. Uh, others die in fighting in the streets. Many workers are shot uh, uh, or arrested and imprisoned and some of them executed, uh, even if they weren't members of the Communist Party. It's a very bloody um, uprising and suppression of the communist movement uh, in Shanghai. And it represents, it signals the break, the split between the Nationalist Party uh, and the Communist Party. All right, so after all of this happened, so Shanghai fell and then a number of other uh, uh, stronghold kind of major cities fell. This is the point when Mao Zedong's ideas really started to be taken, taken more seriously. And the Chinese communists had to uh, regroup in the countryside. And their position was they knew something was going to happen. What was going on wasn't right. Uh, the people weren't being represented. And eventually people were going to do something. And they had two choices. They could either help or they could just get out of the way. And I'll play the clip related to that now. How is the party to survive? What are they to do? It's at this point that uh, the role of Mao Zedong begins to be significant. Um, Mao Zedong, as leader of the Peasant Bureau of the Nationalist Party, had spent a lot of time in the countryside, had spent a lot of time observing what was happening away from the cities, away from the great coastal ports, in places like his home province of Hunan. And what he saw was large peasant movements, uh, not unlike peasant movements that we have seen at earlier times in, in Chinese history, but now movements which were taking place in the modern world, in a modern context, and which could be imbued with a modern ideology and led by, in Mao's view, a modern political party. He saw the uprisings of the peasants as a very, very powerful force, a force so powerful that, as he put it to his comrades, their choice was to either try to lead it or just to get out of the way because this movement was going to sweep across the country and if the Communist Party could lead it, they could turn it into a revolutionary force. Well, these ideas had been pretty marginal up until this time, but in the wake of the suppression of the party in the cities, Mao's ideas suddenly begin to seem a little more reasonable. Okay, I'm sitting here in post and I want to add an extra clip here because later on in my chat with you guys I mentioned the support that the uh, Chinese Nationalist Party had from the Nazi Party in Germany and I think that's a pretty big claim to make without showing firsthand where uh, Kenneth Hammond 
makes reference to that connection. Um, and it also helps further emphasize uh, the, the kinds of people that uh, the National Party relied on when trying to defeat the Chinese Communist Party. There's a lot of other stuff that I didn't include also, uh, because the Chinese Nationalist Party ends up um, also disappointing the American government at, uh, at one point, because they were receiving um, equipment and uh, support to help fight the Japanese. And they were saving that equipment for their fight later on to try to eliminate the Chinese Communist Party. This created a lot of contention in China also, because people in China thought that they should be pushing back against the expansion of Japan and China way more. Um, this is one of the keys that the Ch uh, Communist Party of China relied on also to gain support. Um, but uh, for now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the clip where he specifically mentions the connection with the Nazi Party of Germany. The first several of these efforts uh, are defeated. The communists manage to, uh, to fight back and drive off the nationalist forces. But, uh, but Chiang keeps the pressure up. Uh, he begins in the 30s to get military advice uh, from the Germans, uh, the Nazi party that uh, has come to power in, in Germany in the early 30s, um, begins to form uh, a, a fairly close working relationship with Chang that will be suspended later when they become more, even more closely allied with the Japanese. Uh, but for a while in the mid-30s, German advisors are, are very helpful in, uh, uh, in leading the anti-communist campaigns for Chiang Kai-shek. All right, from here, what I want to do is I want to play another highlight. This one's going to be a little bit longer, but it's really about an epic part of the history, the Long March. Um, this is something that people celebrate even today and talk about. Um, captures the minds and imaginations of people, and so I'm going to play that clip for you here. In October of 1934, uh, the communists decide that um, they're not going to be able to resist Chiang Kai-shek and the encirclement campaign much longer. There is another um, base area uh, far away in northwestern China, uh, centered on a, a small uh, town called Yan'an, and they decide that they're going to try to break out from the Jiangxi area and make their way uh, to Yan'an. This is a long, long way to go, um, and they don't know exactly how to get there uh, or how they will survive uh, in the process of doing so. Nonetheless, they, they figure this is their best option, their only real chance. And so, uh, uh, in mid-October of 1934, 115,000 people uh, break out from the encirclement. A small contingent is left behind uh, in the heartland of, uh, of the Jiangxi uh, uh, base area to uh, uh, make a last stand against the nationalist forces and also to keep those nationalist forces occupied so that they won't uh, be able to pursue uh, the long marchers as they set out. The Long March um, strikes off to the south and west, and in the course of the next year, uh, they troop over several thousand kilometers. Uh, it's not a, a simple uh, uh, straight path off to the northwest that they take. Uh, they travel through several provinces. They have to cross mountain ranges, swamps, uh, deep river gorges. It's a, a very dramatic event. They're constantly being pursued and harassed by nationalist forces. Of the um, 115,000 people who embark on the Long March, 15,000 complete it. So 100,000 people are lost one way or another uh, along the way. One thing I want to note after playing that clip is that um, so, of course, the, the Nationalist Party was receiving and enjoying support from the, the Nazi Party um, in Germany. And during that long march, the people who died um, sacrificing themselves along that uh, route, um, along that campaign, and also the Nazi-backed uh, Nationalist Party members that were killed, these are all numbers that go into the number of deaths that Mao is responsible for. And uh, this, is, this is something that people like to throw around without any of this additional context in terms of what was going on during that time. And, and, and it reminds me of um, the fact that in the Black Book of Communism, they, list, they have a list which is called the number of global deaths related to communism. And they even include Nazi soldiers who died when the Soviet Union defeated them. Those are included in deaths. So people are using this number saying, wow, this is the number of uh, th th this ideology killed. 
Um, but they don't, they're not looking at, well, I, I, actually, th there was a war going on and there were actual Nazis that died as part of these numbers as well. And that, that Black Book of Communism is used by an organization called the Victims, of Com uh, the Victims of Communism Memorial Fund. This is the same fund that Adrian Zentz uh, works for, and he's responsible for a lot of the shady numbers that are being published about uh, Xinjiang, and now it seems he's moved on to Tibet, and people just kind of follow him along. But let's, um, let's stay on topic here, and I want to jump forward to um, after the Chinese Communist Party has won. Now, that's quite a big jump. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that happens in between. I'm just kind of playing highlighted clips for you, and that's why I recommend, once again, to listen to the entire thing. It's 18 hours long, but anybody who has an interest in Chinese history, I really highly recommend it. What I want to play you now is a clip of what the Chinese Nationalist Party did when they escaped to Taiwan, because it's quite shocking, and not many people talk about this anymore, even though they're very keen to talk about Chinese history and the terrible things that happened under Chinese history when it is about somebody that they want to villainize. Now, however, this is not something that many people talk about, and I will play that clip for you now. The withdrawal to Taiwan is preceded uh, late in 1948 by a, an uprising uh, of the indigenous Taiwanese population um, who are not too happy about the idea of their island being taken over by the nationalist forces from the mainland. Uh, but Chiang Kai-shek uh, uh, carries out uh, nationalist forces, uh, carry out a, a fairly large-scale massacre uh, of uh, dissidents and, and uh, resistors in Taiwan and pacify the island to prepare it for the nationalist withdrawal. Uh, the state of martial law, which is imposed on Taiwan at that point late in 1948, uh, stays in effect. Uh, for over 40 years. All right, so that clip, when I was listening to that, I, I was actually listening to that portion when I was on my way here to Jiangxi on the road uh, while driving. It made me really start thinking about my recent trip to Tibet that many of you have probably seen on my channel. And I, I've heard from native uh, Taiwanese people, um, ethnic minorities uh, or the native uh, indigenous people, they um, are not treated, well, they're marginalized in society, or at least they're not happy from the people that I've heard of. And there doesn't seem to be much of a commitment to preserve their culture. And when I contrast that to what I saw in Tibet, in terms of the, the kids in school learning uh, Tibetan calligraphy, dance, uh, typing, music, all this kinds of stuff, and even Han Chinese students who are going to those schools must learn Tibetan. It's mandatory. Um, they not only do a better job at preserving culture, but they're actively trying to bring it back also. If some of you have seen my other video, they're trying to revive and they're funding, the government is funding a project to bring back a, a, a 500 year old style of Tanka painting, um, basically which was lost for 500 years, and they're funding that to bring back Tibetan culture also. And so in, 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 in Taiwan, it doesn't seem that they have the same level of support, um, yet it has a lot of implications for the virtue signaling that comes from, uh, from that direction. Uh, but what I do want to do, though, is I want to move on um, to something that the Chinese Communist Party did that was quite brutal and violent. And it happened during their attempt to rebalance the, 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 the gross um, wealth imbalance in society. And uh, there were a lot of people killed during this process. This is going to be a little bit of a longer clip. I'm going to try to cut it down as short as possible, but there's a lot of really valuable information in here in terms of how they uh, went through the process and how they listened to people. And I'm going to start from the point of Mao's speech, which starts to um, better set the stage and understand why this is all going on. And I'll play that for you now. And on October 1st of 1949, that new government, the People's Republic of China, uh, is proclaimed by Mao Zedong in a, in a speech at, the, uh, at uh, Tiananmen, the Gate of Heavenly Peace, the former southern uh, uh, entry to the, uh, the imperial palace complex. And he, at that point, issues his very famous uh, statement that uh, the Chinese people have stood up. And uh, the establishment of the People's Republic is uh, portrayed, certainly, by the, the communist leadership as finally um, achieving 
the, the goals uh, that had led to the overthrow of the old imperial regime back in 1911, 1912, had been frustrated with the failure of the republic initially, had been threatened even more by the fragmentation of China under warlordism, and then through the in Japanese invasion and the civil war with the nationalists. Finally, here in October of 1949, Mao was saying, uh, uh, this is over. Uh, the long period of warfare and division and, and oppression uh, by foreigners and by reactionary forces in China is over. The People's Republic of China uh, allows the Chinese people to uh, take control of their own destiny. It's a very dramatic uh, moment, a very dramatic uh, speech by Mao, and uh, uh, not entirely um, out of line with uh, the realities of the situation, which were that for the first time in a very long time, there was a single unified national government in China with a coherent and disciplined uh, and basically uh, honest, uh, uh, not corrupt uh, uh, institutional core in the Chinese Communist Party. And the uh, communists were set upon a program which, in their view, would end China's weaknesses and would begin the process of building what they uh, consistently, uh, quite hopefully called, a new China. Now, the core of their program was land reform. Uh, we talked the other, uh, uh, in a previous lecture, about uh, uh, the Jiangxi Soviet back in the early 1930s and how the communists had experimented with various social policies there. One of the things they had sort of tried out there was uh, how to go about land reform, how to redistribute land uh, to make sure that you didn't have some people who owned large estates, others who had no land at all and perhaps could only sell their labor as, uh, as tenants or day workers. Um, how could you achieve a more equitable distribution of land as, the, as a still predominantly agricultural society, land was the, the most important productive resource. So land reform becomes the core of the new program. The process of land reform was a very um, complex one. They would send uh, work teams into villages and they would seek out the people in the villages who, were, who had grievances, who seemed the most politically motivated, and they would work with them to identify who the landowners were and what the uh, 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 what the power relationships within a particular village were. And over a period of weeks or sometimes months, they would prepare for a moment when they would have uh, mass meetings and, and assemble the farmers and have them denounce the landlords uh, and seize the estates or seize the deeds, the titles to the land. Uh, many, many uh, landlords were, were beaten. Uh, many others were killed in this process. Uh, it was a violent uh, transformation of the agricultural uh, system of ownership. And it was a, a very traumatic event, uh, in many instances a very brutal event, and yet it was the, the critical event to allow China to break with the, the economic realities which had begun to stagnate all the way back in the 18th century and really hadn't been transformed or hadn't been modernized in any significant way up to the middle of the 20th century. Uh, land reform, which we talked about in the last lecture, uh, was carried out uh, uh, across the country and was very effective in redistributing land, getting land into the hands of farming families so that basically all the peasants, all the farmers across China had some land. Everybody wound up with something. They had individual titles to this land. They could cultivate it themselves. Uh, uh, and, and, and the great estates, the great landlords, were largely uh, done away with, either uh, uh, given smaller uh, plots of land to farm themselves, or uh, in many instances uh, uh, driven off the land or sometimes killed. And uh, uh, a, a completely new uh, set up in the countryside uh, seemed to be taking shape. So I've got really uh, mixed feelings about uh, this clip and uh, what happened um, in this clip. I posted a much shorter version of it on my Twitter and one of my followers whose ancestors lost their land during the uh, land reforms asked me, um, they said, that the, uh, could there have been a better way to do it? There was obviously a problem that needed to be fixed, but was there a better way to do it? And I think there's always a better way to do anything. And I think there's always a way to learn from, from mistakes. Uh, but I have, I personally, I have no idea. I have no idea how you would break a system up like that. Um, how you would rebalance uh, society. 
you know, America's struggling with the same thing right now. Um, it was quite a while ago they had the Occupy uh, Wall Street protests, which were exactly about this issue. And um, not only were those protests crushed, I think it was about 6,000 people were arrested. Um, some of them were even being arrested a year later. The wealth imbalance has gotten worse. So what is the solution? Uh, can democracy tell us what is the solution to fix this problem? It doesn't seem so. Um, and uh, it, But again, it doesn't excuse what happened and how brutal it was. This is just, um, it's still important to give context to what was going on and what was trying to be fixed. Um, you know, my friend Thomas, some of you guys have seen him on my channel also, my RV friend. He's a descendant also of, uh, it was his grandfather who lost land as well. He uh, was a guy who went to America, worked on the railroad systems, and worked on them for um, a long time, then started working in a grocery store, saved up some money, came back, and he was considered quite wealthy when he came back, bought himself some land, and then the land reforms happened, and he escaped to uh, Hong Kong because he saw what was happening to other landlords. And that's absolutely tragic. He's not one of the guys who was exploiting the system or enriching himself at the expense of the poorest people in public, in society. Um, so that was a really uh, sad thing to, to hear about. Um, now, the government did offer, they did reach out to people like that to try to compensate them, to try to tell them, okay, we're going to make this right for you. But his grandfather didn't trust coming back across the border anymore. He says now that he's done with that. That's, um, uh, he just didn't trust them. Um, so again, it's a, it's a sad part of Chinese history, but one that is um, an event that made sure everyone in society has something. And I remember, uh, it, it makes me think of another story of one of my friends, Dylan, he said when he went to the U.S. and he went to uh, New York City for the first time and he saw homeless people in the streets, he said, I don't get it. Why don't these people just go back to their Laojia, which is their hometown? Because in China, you've all, everybody's got a hometown to go back to. Everybody's got a piece of land. It's like uh, it, it, they, uh, what the land reforms did was change society so much that that would be the response from somebody who sees homelessness in New York City for the first time. So it was a really interesting thing um, that I heard when he was telling me that story. He obviously understands the situation better now, but it was, it was uh, an interesting exchange. Um, so what do I want to move on to now? Um, the, uh, oh yeah, so I put a note here because this is something, I, I, I had to stop the car and write this note because this was really interesting for me to realize when thinking about all of this, that China's current government has a past which has events where many of its own people were killed during an attempt to lift the lowest parts of its population up. But in contrast, America's government, today's America's government, the same one villainizing China nonstop, has a current system that kills many, not many of its own people, many foreign people in foreign lands that don't belong to them in order to further enrich the richest people in their society, whether it be their oil companies or natural resource companies uh, that benefit from sanctioning and overthrowing foreign governments who aren't sufficiently friendly to American corporate interests. You know, where there were stories of even a Mexican company being sanctioned for sending drinking water to Venezuela during the drinking water crisis. What is going on is pure evil. And everything they do is designed to benefit the top 2%, 3% of their society. It's completely backwards. Um, and so to talk about what happened during China's past while they were trying to lift the lowest parts of their population up, um, it, it, it really is... Uh, lacking context in the most ignorant possible way, in my personal opinion. So now I'm going to move on to another clip and to further emphasize that despite some major missteps and terribly executed policies, this uh, next clip really is designed to show the, um, the morals or the principles that Mao was at least working with when trying to make these changes. Land reform was critical to eliminating the political control of the old uh, rural elites. Uh, and to creating the conditions, uh, to rewarding the peasants for their support of the party, and to creating the conditions for improving agricultural production. Uh, it was carried out in tandem with other reforms that were directed also at transforming the traditional um, rural uh, Confucian sort of, of popular culture. And the most critical here step here was the passage of what's called the marriage law. The marriage law was meant to abolish certain traditional practices, uh, principally arranged marriage. Uh, it allowed people to marry at their own will. 
Uh, it allowed for divorce. It allowed both men and women to initiate divorce. And perhaps most significantly, when land reform was carried out, under the terms of the marriage law, land as it was redistributed was not simply given to the head of a household, which would mean that it was basically redistributed among the men, but was given to both men and women, so that men and women, husband and wife, uh, would, have, would each have their own economic resources. And this was meant to empower women uh, so that the, the legal uh, empowerments of uh, divorce and, and free marriage had some economic support, had some substance to them. So these were very radical reforms uh, directed at transforming the, uh, the core values, the core structures of the traditional system. And they were very effective in doing so. As Mao once famously said, women hold up half of the sky. And uh, although this particular lecture ended on a little bit of a negative note for uh, uh, women's rights, uh, this lecture that I'm, I, I listened to was filmed, I think, 15, 16 years ago. Now you can see there are a lot of really high-powered female executives in China. And I think there's a lot of progress that has been made um, further since the time that that lecture had finished. And, and, um, but I think a lot of work still needs to be done. Um, especially when you look at the top leadership in China and the, um, the gender imbalance there. Um, I think there's definitely a lot that needs to be done. But the, these principles do exist in society. Um, the next clip I want to talk about is another good-intentioned policy that resulted in failure and a huge cost of life. And that was, of course, the Great Leap Forward. And um, this is also, of course, um, caused a death that was uh, attributed to Mao's rule. Um, however, the reason it failed is a little bit more complex than most people give it credit for, and I'm going to play that clip for you now. The Great Leap achieves many very positive objectives, but it runs into some even more powerful negative forces. Uh, the core problem that develops with the Great Leap Forward uh, is linked in many ways to Mao's idea of how to motivate people, of how to get the vast masses of China to work together and, and, and achieve almost by an act of will uh, a process of economic development. Enthusiasm is, is basic in this process and the enthusiasm for success is such that people begin to falsify their reports of success. Not in a gross way, not in an excessive way, but if you add a few percentage points at the bottom level of, of reporting and the person at the next level adds a few percentage points and the person at the next level adds a few percentage points, by the time you get up to the national level, the level where the state council, the state planning bureau is formulating its information, uh, uh, making its plans for the future, you have gross distortions in what's going on. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, 1957, 1958, 1959, initially the Great Leap Forward itself is a huge success. Crop production increases. The problem is it doesn't increase in reality as much as it increases on paper. It does gain, but it doesn't gain as much. Based on false figures, based on misunderstood realities in the countryside, the planners decide so much has been achieved, they can lift various kinds of rationing restrictions, they can allow people to basically uh, consume what they want. And this results in uh, a lot of grain, uh, a lot of livestock, a lot of food resources of one kind and another, not making their way into the supply system for the cities where they're at the same time trying to build up industry and, and raise the standard of living of the urban population. And instead, um, there's initially a, a sort of glut in the countryside. As a result of that, and then as a result of excessively high targets set for the next year, um, you, there begins to be a crisis in agricultural production. There's not enough food. Food which they thought was going to be there as a reserve has been consumed. Uh, as we move into 1959, uh, the situation begins to be much worse. Uh, bad weather sets in. A variety of other circumstances uh, begin to contribute to problems in the countryside. Um, and by early 1959, food shortages become characteristic. Now, there's a lot of debate, uh, a lot of dispute in academia about the extent of the hunger, the extent of starvation that follows. Uh, you'll see figures uh, uh, ranging up to 20 million people uh, dying as a result of 
uh, of the food crisis during the Great Leap Forward. Uh, it's, it's hard to know exactly what the precise figures should be, uh, but certainly, uh, no matter how you look at it, it's a period of hardship, it's a period of widespread malnutrition, and certainly of uh, significant deaths resulting from uh, the shortfalls of the Great Leap Forward. So the Great Leap Forward, it really had so many circumstances align at the perfect, um, or I should say imperfect time for disaster. Um, there are other things that they did that were really, really poor policies that, that worsened the situation. Uh, there was a campaign to get rid of pests in China and sparrows were on that list and they uh, basically killed them to near extinction. Um, that increased the uh, insect problem, which further destroyed crops and um, uh, created an even worse situation with the famine. But it was just a, a pretty terrible time. You know, uh, it, there's, there's a lot of people who know very well uh, how terrible this was uh, for China's history. And it's part of the reason why there's a campaign going on now to reduce food waste. Um, I've been in actually in a few restaurants recently where they've got signs on the wall saying, do not order more than you can eat. Order a little bit first, and then if you need more, order more after. People are really uh, taking it seriously. Now, of course, there's Western media who have twisted this and saying there's a food shortage problem in China now. Uh, that's why they're doing this. I, I think um, it's a, it, it, it highlights a really backward way of thinking, that saying that the only reason you would possibly say to stop f uh, wasting food is because you have a food shortage problem. Obviously, um, that's not the case. I don't see any um, evidence of that here, and I think it's a great campaign to do. And a lot of it is born from these kinds of situations in, um, in China's past. Uh, more negative events happen later on, um, especially when political infighting starts, where Mao is basically fighting against the Communist Party of China itself, when it becomes a little bit too bureaucratic and corrupt. But I think I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, you can really go to that and, um, and watch the entire lecture if you want, or even just the, the portions of the lecture that are related to the um, Communist Party of China. I am really um, tempted to continue dragging this video on a bit to um, talk a little bit about why the Communist Party of China has reached a point where it has such widespread support in China. You know, I, I think um, a lot of you have seen some of my followers, at least the Edelman Trust Barometer, um, and the recent uh, independent study by Harvard's Ash Center shows that the Chinese government enjoys overwhelming support from its people. We're talking in the 90% range. And uh, that's despite its past. That's despite its uh, missteps that um, it has made. And it's despite the fact that some people have suffered um, under uh, poorly executed policies here. And I think... Um, to some of you, the answer to that question might already be obvious when you look at um, what have they accomplished over these last few decades um, in terms of the, um, if you look at the Gini coefficient, the uh, wealth imbalance, it has been steadily going down. There was a little bit of an uptick in the last couple of years, but generally keeping it in check really well. Um, when you consider how many hundreds of millions of people were lifted out of poverty. Uh, so I think perhaps that is uh, already going to be obvious to you, or now that you know what the uh, party's underlying principles are when they're making policy. But I think I'm going to fit those ideas and discussions into future videos, because this video is going to drag on to uh, a little bit longer. Uh, so once again, definitely go check out um, this talk. Uh, you can buy, you can get it on Audible with one credit. I found out afterwards, and that's where I got all these clips, that it's available for free on YouTube as well. Personally, I still enjoy listening it to an Audible uh, because you can click uh, bookmarks. You can make bookmarks and stuff like that and notes and all kinds of stuff. And then obviously you can listen to it in the car. But it's a great video. Um, I want to do... Uh, a great lecture rather. I want to do some more videos around this topic. I'm going to slowly introduce them in. I've been a little bit busy here during uh, Mid-Autumn Festival, traveling around, visiting family, having some uh, uh, big meals. Uh, we, we took the RV out. And we were, we were uh, picking some fresh fruits off of the tree and stuff like that. And I haven't been doing much uh, filming. I've been enjoying the time with the family. And, uh, but when I do get back to making videos, Depending on how this video turns out too in the in the RV, I don't know how the sound quality is going to turn out, how the how everything's going to turn out. If this is if this works out well and I get some positive feedback for it, this is going to be really good for vlogging because I'm planning on doing some pretty epic tricks, tricks, trips, and um, I want to do some vlog vlogs, uh, sit down and talk vlogs 
while I'm on the road. And of course, do some outdoor walking around ones also. So I'm gonna wrap it up here, guys. I hope um, you found this interesting and I hope you head over to Kev uh, Kenneth Hammond's uh, full lecture and check it out because it's definitely well worth the time no matter how long it takes you to finish. Take care, guys, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.